Okay, welcome to uh, the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Uh, as you know, if you've watched this program in the past, we've been off the air for a couple years. We did start rebroadcasting a few programs in the past few weeks uh, since January, but this will be our first new show in the new series. So welcome to that. We will be uh, broadcasting once a week with a, with a new show. So our first guest is Nicholas Rue. Hi, yeah, David. That's the hi, hi, uh, and uh, he is with Friends of the Earth France. So uh, you are our first non-American uh, guest. So uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we want to talk about something called TTIP. Yes. And tell us what TTIP is. Well, TTIP is a free trade agreement that is being negotiated between the United States and the European Union. And uh, so it's been negotiated since 2013 in secret. So very little information has reached the media or um, the population. All the information that we know is based on leaks that have been linked by, linked by uh, NGOs or the media and so on. And uh, the aim of TTIP is mainly to remove barriers to trade mm -hmm. and to promote investment. So by removing barriers to trade, I mean removing tariff, for example, even though tariffs are a bit low now, very low, I should say, apart maybe on some agriculture products, they are very low between the US and EU. But the, um, the main aspect and the main danger to TTIP is removing non-tariff measures. By non-tariff measures, I mean norms and regulations, standards that are very different from the US and EU, and big corporations think that these standards, they are they hamper trade between the two continents. Okay, all right, and TTIP stands for? TTIP stands for Transatlantic, uh, Transatlantic, uh, no, hang on. Yeah. Trade and Investment Partnership. Right. Okay. It used to be, at the beginning, they used to call it TAFTA, which is yes. Transatlantic Free Trade Agreement, but because of NAFTA, they thought, okay, it doesn't sound so good because NAFTA doesn't have mm -hmm. such a great reputation. Mm -hmm. So they changed it to TTIP because partnership sounds much better. You know, like it's a partnership, so it must be good. You know? uh, yeah, yeah, just just like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Sounded like a good exactly. deal. Because it sounded uh, like a good yeah, deal. Yeah. want to reach across the table yeah. and work together. Exactly. Right, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah, when, when it was uh, TAFTA, we did uh, play on that here, you know, mm -hmm. and made the direct connection between that and NAFTA, so they were probably wise in changing it. Exactly. <laughs> but, but, but we can't see through that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, how is it, I mentioned the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which uh, now is dead. Um, that was, of course, the agreement that we were, the U.S. was negotiating with, with Pacific Rim mm -hmm. company, uh, countries. How were those two different, or, or are they different? The ideology behind it is not different. These two agreements are based on the free trade ideology. So it's an ideology that promotes corporate interest. So in that sense, they are very similar. The difference is the economies, is the economies, the economies are involved. Trans-Pacific Partnership involves 12 countries, very different economies. Some of them have a strong economy, like the US. Some of them have weaker economies. and what the U.S. was trying to do is, one of the things that the U.S. was trying to do is impose its views on weaker economies, whereas TTIP is, involves two very strong economies, one of the two of the strongest economies in the world, meaning that what's at stake is very different. And that's, as I said, like non-tariff measures, standards is one of the main one of the main aspects of, uh, of TTIP. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, and you mentioned that um, that tariffs between the U.S. and uh, uh, the European Union mm. are really quite low. They are. Right, okay. It's true. A and so the, uh, I, I am pretty sure that, you know, the sales job will be that it lowers tariffs. The, sorry, say I, I say the, the sales job, the yeah. promoters mm. of the, this agreement, yeah. as with the TPP, said, well, this will lower, lower tariffs and will you increase trade. Yes. But that's not really the objective. Of TTIP. Of TTIP. Not really. Apart from very specific sectors like agriculture, for instance, where the tariffs are really high because both the EU and the US have been very protective of their agriculture sector. 
but uh, no tariffs is not the main issue really main issue is market access for example like european corporations they want to have access to the u.s uh, public procurement for instance which is protected by the Bi the buy american act mm -hmm. and that's something that the european are not very happy about because like well it's a it's a trade barrier you know we would, we would like to penetrate this market mm -hmm. but this buy american act is stopping us from doing it and on the other side in the eu for instance we have stronger regulations when it comes to food safety for instance like hormone hormone uh, fed beef for example you cannot export to the eu beef that was fed with hormone oh. or you cannot export to the eu chicken that was washed with uh, chlorine this can, or gmo for example mm -hmm. genetically modified organisms are mostly banned for human consumption in eu and this is something the us is not happy about mm -hmm. because they're saying okay these non-tariff measures they actually you know barrier to trade you know and we want these removed but um the problem is the us and eu they're used to dealing with weaker economies meaning they can bully them sort of mm -hmm. but in that sense you've got the eu and the us and they are both very tough negotiators who are not used to giving in or you know giving concessions let's mm -hmm. say and that's why um, these negotiations have been very tough, actually, between the two blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, how long have the negotiations been going on? Since 2013. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's been four years. Three, yeah, already years. four okay. years. Uh, to be perfectly honest, they've been in limbo for the past for the past six months, I would say, about for the past six months. Mm -hmm. Even before the election of Trump. I mean, Trump obviously is a big question mark mm -hmm. because we don't know exactly what he wants to do, even though some members of his administration said that TTIP was not such a good idea and they would like to privilege bilateral mm -hmm. agreement. But even before that, for the reason I've just explained, TTIP was in limbo because the US wasn't willing to give in any concessions to, to uh, the European Union. Mm -hmm. And same thing for, for Europe. They were like, no, I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. we're not going to give you that this in spite of the, mm -hmm. of the pressure. Okay. And from what reading I have done, one of the sticking points was the insistence of, by the U.S. Uh, that the investor state protection clauses be included in the agreement, and at least a couple of European nations seem to be pretty opposed to that. Yes, uh, this investor state dispute settlement, or ISDS, mm -hmm. um, has become a very toxic issue in, uh, in Europe. And I'd say mostly because of all the campaigning that's been done by many organizations that, really, that have tried to raise awareness among the population. And uh, they've come up with a new system, which is so-called public, but it's just doesn't change a lot. Frost I mean, frosting on the cake. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Some people said it's just putting lipstick on a pig, you know, yes, it doesn't uh -huh. change. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change the fact that there is a pig, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it's become, uh, it's become a big issue. And the US is not even willing to accept this new European system mm -hmm. because like this investment protection system is actually has been, do has been doing so much damages for the past 20, 30 years you now in the world. You know, many uh, huge corporations use it to uh, stop states from uh, regulating, from uh, enacting public interest measures when it comes to, for example, health, the environment, labor laws. And we've seen many examples where, for instance, uh, well, if you look at Canada, for instance, they banned a toxic uh, diesel additive called MMT a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, the company that produced it was an American company, Ethyl, and they weren't pretty happy about that. So because of NAFTA, they could use the investment protection clause to attack, to sue Canada. Mm -hmm. So they sued Canada and they won. So Canada had to lift the ban eventually. And we've seen all kind, I mean, this type of lawsuits everywhere in the world. Like in Egypt, for example, it's a pretty good example. It was actually a French corporation. The Egyptian government decided to raise the minimum wage, which you might think is a good idea for, you know, poor populations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this French company called Veolia wasn't pretty happy about it because like, well, hang on, this is going to cost us money. So we don't want that. Mm -hmm. So they sued Egypt. and. The lawsuit has been ongoing, but... Um, well, that hasn't been decided No, yet. not yet. Okay. But we've seen all kinds of, um, yeah, lawsuits. There's officially, there's over 700 ISDS lawsuits in the world. Mm -hmm. And that excludes all the ones that haven't been registered officially, and we know that there's quite oh, a yeah. few as well. Right. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that 
Uh, NAFTA was the first trade agreement, the North America Free Trade Agreement with the US, Canada, and Mexico that had this kind of clause in it. Uh, and of course, at the beginning, there were very few cases, but now you say 700. Mm. Right. Officially, so, uh, Reg official. seven, 700 registered, right. Yes, right. but many of, the, many of them are secret. Right. And, and the process of, um, of, of uh, I, I want to say adjudicating, but that's not the right word because this is not really a court system. It's not a court system. It's uh, a private, corporate, friendly arbitration system. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Oh, the, and the processes that they use to come to their decisions are very secretive also. Mm. Right, yeah. So. Yeah, it's very secretive. It's uh, it's and it's based. The problem is, it's based on this ideology again, on on the idea that trade is the answer to everything. And we're not saying trade is is bad. Of course, trade is part of humanity, you know. But not trade that promotes corporate interest only uh, at the expense of public interest. And uh, and this particular system, the uh, ISDS system, is perfect example, a perfect lobbying tool given to corporations mm -hmm. and at, which is legal that's the the worst thing about it it is legal actually it's it's not maybe ethical but it is legal yes yeah. Uh, right yeah right yeah so if uh, if ttip were to expand trade between the us and and uh, your the european union isn't that a good thing uh, I think we have to um, we have to take another angle because of course trade is a good thing but this type of agreement like TTIP like TPP they don't really promote trade they promote corporate interest so the idea is not like okay everyone will benefit from from trade the population will have decent jobs and so on no it would just continue this process of concentrating profits within a few hands and um, so TTIP, TPP, what happens is it's based on this idea that, well, natural resources are, for example, infinite, that the only answer to all the problems is growth, for example, consumerism, competition, and so on. And we've seen what's been happening. I mean, as you mentioned NAFTA, you mentioned, I mean, there's other treaties. So it's not something new. We've seen what's been happening for the past 20, 30 years since the Reagan he, in, uh, in mm -hmm. the US for example and the profits have been you know moved towards a few hands only and a very typical example like uh, I think it's um, in the 60s in the US actually the wage gap between top executives and average worker was about 20 to 1 now it's over 350 to 1 mm -hmm. so that illustrates perfectly what's been happening with the free trade ideology neoliberalism and those free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, a and, and these trade agreements are only a part of this neoliberal agenda. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, and, and, uh, but it's a, very, it's a very crucial part. Uh, it is, it is because it makes, it's, it's a legal tool that uh, makes all the, I'd say, everything that the corporation needs to increase their power they get it, I mean, they make it legal through these agreements, like intellectual property uh, rights, for instance, like Big Pharma, they want to have data protection over their um, patents for, for uh, drugs and medicines, mm -hmm. meaning that some countries like India or, or Vietnam, whatever, they cannot have access to generic life-saving uh, treatments because of this Big Pharma. And it's become legal through these agreements. And that was one of the main issues of TPP, by the way, uh, right. like increasing data protection for, um, for drugs and life-saving medicines, which yeah. would have had a terrible impact on, on developing countries. Right. Okay. C can you dive just a little bit more into that data protection? Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? I'll, I'll bet that most of our audience has no clue. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so for a example, little, little technical. Uh, okay. So let's say, let's say like a, a when when a pharmaceutical company comes up with a new treatment they're going to have like a 20 year patent meaning that for 20 years they have the exclusivity mm -hmm. and what happened with tpp this was increased to seven was it eight or seven or eight years i think i think it was anyway i mean you get the yeah, idea yeah, so, so right. data protection yeah, uh -huh. was increased by seven years meaning that 
for seven extra years, the like companies, pharma pharmaceutical companies that produce generic treatments mm -hmm. wouldn't have access to this data, meaning they wouldn't be able to produce generic uh, treatments. And in some countries like, like India, like Vietnam, like poor countries where people cannot afford to spend, I don't know, like $2,000 or $5,000 a month on a treatment curing cancer or, or multiple sclerosis, this kind of, you know, mm -hmm. chronic diseases. This means that these people will not be able to access these medicines until 25 years after or 28 years after they are released. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, so, so these generic medicine manufacturers have to have the data in order exactly. to prove the safety of exactly. the medicines. Exactly. That exactly. Uh, otherwise, the, exactly. Yeah, otherwise they have to redo the testing to prove their exactly. safety before they can exactly. actually market them. Mm. Right. Yeah. So that that's that's the crucial part exactly. is that is that do you do you have a sharing economy? I mean that's a that's a kind of a buzzword now is is the sharing economy, except the pharmaceutical companies don't want to have a sharing economy. Exactly. Right? And they the want to have an exclusive market. Sure. Definitely. And it, I mean the pharmaceutical company is a perfect example, but it's not the only right. example. So instead of promoting what many things should be fairer like f i mean fair trade would be should be based on solidarity and not like you know exclusivity mm -hmm. and competition and making more profits at the expense of of uh, the largest part of the population there was actually like a study that was released recently eight the the eight richest people in the world mm -hmm. they have as much wealth as half of the poor population of the poorest population in the world mm -hmm. Meaning that eight people have as much as about three and a half billion of the poorest people in the world, which is outrageous. Out outrageous is mm. a, a mild term. <laughs> yes, yes, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you would draw at least some of that, a major portion of that, to the enactment of these trade agreements. Mm. Yes, definitely. Right. I mean, as you were saying, they are a very significant tool of this neoliberal agenda. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Friends of the Earth France. Mm. What do they do? What, what positions do they take? Or on trade agreements. They, on or on trade agreements or, or otherwise? Well, Friends of the Earth France campaigns mostly on um, well, environmental issues a lot, agriculture issues, trade justice, uh, environmental justice, this kind of thing, climate issues, obviously. And mainly we've been focusing um, on agriculture and trade agreements, meaning okay. what will be the impact of TTIP, of CETA, which is another agreement between Europe and Canada, mm -hmm. what will be the, the impact of these agreements on the French and European agriculture. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So talk about, you, you mentioned food safety yeah. er, earlier as being a, a, a danger point that TTIP um, uh, would have an impact on. So talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, well, first of all, the way the way I think um, production, food production occurs in the US and EU is totally different. And Europe and France mostly is, we have something called the precaution principle. Oh, precautionary. Precautionary principle. Precautionary, sure. sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. precautionary principle. Yeah, uh -huh. Meaning that even if there, is, there isn't a scientific certainty, if we have doubt that the product might be harmful to the environment, to health of people, we're going to ban it until we have a certainty that it is not harmful, mm -hmm. which is what, which is why, sorry, GM genetically modified products are banned in uh, in EU. In the US, you don't have that. Uh, no. In the US, you need a scientific proof that okay, this is 100% harmful to health or to environment. So, in that case, we're going to ban it. But until then, we won't ban it. Yeah. That's why GM food is authorized, allowed in the US, and it's not right. in the EU. Yeah, so, so we uh, Americans become guinea pigs on all this stuff, right? A little bit, right. yeah, oh, definitely. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, the population, and most of the people in the U.S. don't know that because, well, because of this uh, <laughs> poor media, law that was yeah. enacted like 20 years <laughs> ago. <laughs> right. You cannot label it, so yes. you don't mm -hmm. even know that you eat uh, GM right. product because mm -hmm. of this, you know, anyway. Uh, yes, all right. And um, so that's one very important thing to keep in mind. And okay. that's why in Europe, for example, we cannot have we cannot have a beef that was fed with hormone hormones, for example, product or mm -hmm. or chicken that was washed with chlorine, this kind of thing. So in that sense, we have very we have stronger food safety standards 
which the US is not very happy about. Okay. Also, okay. But we also have like strong uh, environmental standards as well. Stronger. Okay. And, and, and so TTIP would harmonize those regulations between the two? Uh, that's the idea, well, and that's the, the main that's the main point of, of TTIP. That's why we call TTIP and other treaties that are similar, new generation treaties, because they don't, they're not like these old trade agreements that deal with tariffs only. We deal with regulations, mm -hmm. and we deal with regulations that will have an impact on, on the populations and, and everyday life aspects, if you like, mm -hmm. of most of the population. And um, sorry, I lost track. What was the question again? <laughs> no, I, actually, I forgot too. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So, but um, um, yeah, but that's the, that's the idea basically. Oh, I was talking about harmonization. harmonization. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Harmonizing, right. and and the idea is either I'm harmonizing, so I have same kind of rules, or mutual recognition, saying okay, so in the U.S. you can have GM product. In France, we don't have it, but you guys say it's safe, so we're gonna say okay, it's safe for us as well. That's right. another danger. Okay. Yeah. So what you what what the real concern is that we're harmonizing to the lowest standards instead that's of harmonizing to that's the highest yeah, standards. Exactly. That's right. a race where we that's why we say it's a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And this regulatory cooperation, because that's what it's called, will depend on corporate interest again. It will be influenced by corporate interest. TTIP and, and European Canada mm -hmm. Agreement, they um, they aim at or I mean creating this regulatory cooperation forum or whatever the name is and this forum would be directly influenced by corporations so corporations will say okay you guys i mean lobbyists from corporation will say okay you guys gonna have to work on that because we have problem with that oh. and even though ttip as i said it's a bit of in limbo and canada hasn't been implemented yet i mean the cita trinu agreement sorry hasn't been implemented yet but there's already pressure from from corporations and for example Chevron which is like a major energy and oil uh, industry in, uh, in mm -hmm. the US we've seen because of leaks that that Chevron has been lobbying the European Union to in to include investor protections mm -hmm. so they can you know challenge public interest decision with regards to health or the environment and so on oh yeah okay right. so this yeah. guy this corporation we have strong say in this regulatory Cooperation process. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let, let's talk about one that would affect the United States. So, buy American. Mm -hmm. uh, that w we ha we have requirements on buying American, and uh, you indicated that that would be a requirement that would likely go away. So, yeah. how, how does that affect the United States? Uh, I, I suppose first, for a lot of our audience. I'm going to guess they probably don't know what Buy American is mm. in the first place. So if you could explain that yeah. just briefly, and then how does the agreement uh, affect that? Okay, well, first of all, I have to say I live in Paris. I I'm, I'm <laughs> French, so I'm not a specialist <laughs> in the Buy American sure. Act. I just know that it's an act that promotes local um, local business, basically. So like when for public procurement, so like construction sites, for example, construction works and so on, the um, the public procurement will be given to American companies, yes. and you cannot have foreign foreigners, you know, getting those contracts and and working on these on these sites. Which I think is, even though as I said, I'm not a specialist of of this particular act, but I think it's a fair idea, you know, like promoting local economies, you know. Yes. So, uh, but as I said, the European, because in France we have very powerful, for example, uh, construction companies, you know, and they want to have access to the federal. Uh, public procurement you know mm -hmm. so that's yeah that's a that's a big problem because if you start liberalizing everything then you encourage the race to the bottom because companies will have to lower wages because mm -hmm. if they don't lower wages it means that they will be more expensive so if there's a company let's say from Romania that's cheaper they're gonna say okay we're gonna give the contract to this Romanian company because right. Romanians will pay their workers far less than this US company uh, mm -hmm. does so, um, so that would be actually very bad for US workers because they will either lose their jobs or they will have to work for ver for like a small um, a smaller uh, a smaller yeah. Uh, yeah, wage, wage. You know? right yeah. okay yeah 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 so so this was also a big part of the trans pacific partnership mm -hmm. uh, was was getting rid of the buy america uh, protections yeah. that we have uh, and uh, uh, and and uh, actually what it what it did is it said that companies in these other 12 or 11 nations could uh, 
could bid on American contracts mm -hmm. as if they were American companies. So it didn't get rid of the requirement, but it just said that these companies also that are not based in the United States would be regarded as American companies for public procurement contracts. Uh, and I, I would assume that maybe that would be what they would be talking about with TTIP also. Nonetheless, your point is that uh, by American uh, requirements are designed to benefit local economies. Exactly. In one of the one of the effects of these agreements is that local economies uh, are attacked, while global economies and markets are um, enhanced. Mm. Uh, being polite. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, um, and if yeah. I can mention that's yes. another aspect actually that will affect the U.S. as well as the rest of the world is the liberalization of the energy sector. And that's mm -hmm. something that Trump, for example, has said that he wanted to deregulate the shell gas and shell, uh, shell oil uh, industry, you know, mm -hmm. making it easier for co companies to, expo to explore um, shell gas and shell oil. And the U.S. is, a, a, the, sorry, the Euro European Union has a strong interest in that because, because of the crisis with Russia, most notably, they are really interested in the U.S. oil. So they want the U.S. No. to uh, liberalize, you know, oh, the yeah. energy sector, which is something Trump, yeah, as I said, is not, is actually in favor of. Uh -huh. So that will have, a gr I mean, a, a massive impact because obviously environmental impact in the U.S. And a few years ago, there was a few like really big stories in the media about shale gas and shale oil, which mm -hmm. were pretty bad, you know, affecting uh, yes. U.S. U.S. people, right. and uh, also climate. I mean, we have faced huge climate crisis at the moment and promoting fossil fuel fossil mm -hmm. energy you know like yeah. oil and shale gas shale oil is not a solution right yeah okay i'm going to say thank you very much for being on the program thank you for inviting right. me it was yeah. a pleasure right yeah well i, I hope we'll, hopefully this is illuminating for some of our our audiences to you know this is kind of a as you said this is a secret agreement and just like the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a secret agreement, most of our people don't know about it yet, so we need to know, so thank you very much. I do want to let our audience know that there are a couple of, of uh, websites that you can go to if you want to learn more about uh, TTIP, the uh, Trans-America Trade and Investment Partnership. So one of them is uh, the website that Nicholas is associated with. It's bilater <coughs> bilaterals dot org so that's uh, plural bilaterals dot org and another one a, an american site public citizen dot org is also an excellent uh, source for information about this agreement so uh, please do check it out thank you for uh, watching the program and we will see you again next week bye